Uh, in just a moment, I'll ask a friend of mine, Brian Pate, who's tuned in here. Uh, he's going to lead us in prayer in just a little bit. Um, so looking forward to that. Brian's a missionary. Uh, he's serving in Latin America, and uh, he does teaching himself. So anyway, I'm delighted to have Brian here with the other. I looked down the list. Brian, Brian, Brian. Um, look down, down the list, and I'm delighted to have two Brians here. And uh, so we'll meet him in just a second. But Brian Collins, you've already met. Um, and uh, Brian Collins has taught for us several times. He'll be back with us a week from today. Some, I, I would be curious if you drop in the chat, as far as I know, only two or three of us were able to join before when Brian uh, Collins introduced or talked to us about the, um, the uh, Olivet Discourse. So anyway, if you did already hear about that, because we did put that on our YouTube channel, let me know there. But we're looking forward to hearing any, in any case about the Olivet Discourse a week from now, and that connects in with a lot of intertextuality. So that's that. Um, so, uh, okay, if I can ask uh, Brian Pate then to lead us. So thinking through the time zones here, we have a lot. Brian Pate, uh, what is your time zone there? I think is Brazil the same time zone as uh, an hour or two off of the East Coast? No? Yeah, so it's 9 a.m. here now. Got it. So anyway, we're covering Germany. We've got uh, someone in Europe and Latin America and the U.S. and then a lot of the rest of us are in uh, Southeast Asia. So, all right. The other Brian, Brian Tate, great to see you, brother. Um, if you don't mind leading us in prayer and then I'll look forward to hearing from, uh, we'll all look forward to hearing Dr. Collins' lecture for us today. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you too, Brian. I, I, when I heard it was going to be Brian on the land, I'm like, man, I got I to gotta hear this. So it's good to see you, Brian. Duncan. Thank you. Let's Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for how precious your word is to us. I pray even now that you would help our minds be clear and help our, us to be able to receive your word and, and help Brian as he teaches that he would be able to do so with clarity and uh, that he would remember what he wants to say and say it in the order that would be best. God, would you, would you bless him and guide him? And God, would you, would you use this in our lives? Not just that it would be an academic curiosity, but that this would really transform the way we read the Bible, the way that we love you and love your word. God, I pray that this would fill us with, with joy of being able to study the Bible together and be able to teach it. And God, I pray that you would use this time right now to further your kingdom around the world. We pray this in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Thanks. Well, I, I hope I don't disappoint Brian here, but uh, I, my topic actually today is um, Galatians 4, an allegory. So oh, I'm out. <laughs> So um, well, hopefully we can get you some stuff on the land uh, to satisfy that itch at some point. Um, now, I talked to Dr. Arnold, and he mentioned that he had given an assignment to those that are, that are actually in the class, and that was to look at some commentaries, some commentary literature on, um, on Galatians 4, uh, especially Galatians 4, 31 to 32, to look at various interpretations there. And I, I want to... I want to open it up at the very beginning here to get some feedback. Uh, what were some of the commentaries that you all looked at? You can either speak out uh, verbally or add that to the chat. What were some of the resources that you all uh, made use of in that exercise? Uh, so Schreiner and Luther, uh, I see uh, Brother Duncan used. Uh, NAC and NICA. NAC is uh, Timothy George, and NICA is, uh, I think, oh, well, NICA, there's two. There's Fung, and then I think Scott McKnight updated that as maybe the new one. Um, Fung, okay. BECNT, which would be uh, Douglas Moo. Very good. EBC, NAC, and Beal and Carson. I forget who did EBC. Um, For some reason, I don't have that volume handy. Oh, Everett Harrison. Okay, very good. Very good. 
Okay, well, that's helpful to know. Uh, these are these are the same resources uh, in general that I was looking at as well in preparing this. Some others, but but these are these are good. Any uh, as we go into this, did anyone have any questions? I got into this because I had I had a question um, that I raised in a class once, and I wasn't satisfied with the teacher's answer. Uh, so maybe hopefully, hopefully I will satisfy you better <laughs> with the answer. But my question was. Uh, if I'm not supposed to interpret scripture allegorically, why is Paul doing that here? And the answer I received was, well, because Paul was an apostle. And Paul can do things that, uh, that uh, we can't do. Um, and I thought, well, I, I, don't, I, I think it'd be better to see Paul as a model for how I interpret scripture than to use the New Testament as a model for how I interpret scripture. Of course, there are some that would look at this passage and say, well, an allegorical approach uh, to interpreting scripture is actually justified uh, by uh, this passage. And it, that was actually why I, I included this passage in my dissertation. I had to engage with people making that argument. Um, are there other questions that some of you are bringing to this passage? Things that you wanna see answered today as we, as we move through the passage. I can see Dr. Arnold's mouth moving, but I don't hear any sound. Still no sound from Dr. Arnold. Okay, I see uh, Dr. Arnold said, what about the idea that Paul is using this allegory uh, to return their attack back on them? So it's kind of a polemical use of allegory. Yeah, I've, I've heard that. Uh, I, I think as we go through this, we'll find that there's actually a better, a better approach uh, here that we don't need to, uh, um, we don't necessarily need to see this as just a polemic use. Okay, so uh, we have a couple other questions here. Um, was Hagar cast out by God? Literally, I, 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 I would, I mean, she was physically removed. Um, you may, may even mean spiritually, was she, was, did, she, did she lack a relationship with God? I don't know that we're going to get into that uh, today. Um, is Mount Sinai in Arabia? And again, I don't think we're going to jump into that in detail, Brother Kenneth. Uh, but there is, there is debate both about where Mount Sinai could be located. Is it on the Sinai Peninsula or is it on the Arabian Peninsula? Or there's also debate about in Rome, where did that uh, Arabian Peninsula, where did that Arabia uh, province slide? Did that encompass the Sinai Peninsula? So there's different views on there. Yeah, Brother Duncan here raised the issue of this, is this typology or is this allegory? And I think that's where I want to take off as our uh, as our leading question here. Um, so in the King James, it, uh, verse twenty four leads off with uh, with the statement, "Which things are an allegory?" <clears throat> and I, you know, so you might read that and might say, "Well, this text would seem to be a clear cut uh, case of uh, allegorical interpretation." But actually, neither the translations nor the commentators can agree on whether Paul is actually claiming to interpret allegorically according to the sense of what that term has come to mean. Um, the ESV, when it translates this, it clarifies that Paul's not claiming that Genesis was written as an allegory. It's that his interpretation is allegorical. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically, I believe is how the ESV translates that. Other translations actually remove the word allegory altogether. So New King James will say which things are symbolic. Uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible, and, and I don't think the CSB changed this when it was updated, uh, says these things are illustrations. Um, the NIV says uh, these things are ta being taken figuratively. And the ambiguity of this term that's being reflected in the translation is, was actually recognized in the ancient times. This was not a technical term uh, when Paul wrote. Um, 
In fact, Origen and Augustine, they don't actually make a distinction between figures of speech and allegorical interpretations. So this is a fairly broad term uh, that, that Paul is, is using here. Now, some interpreters throughout history have said that Paul is indeed interpreting, uh, employing allegorical interpretation here. Uh, that would be Thomas Aquinas's view. That would be uh, John Eady's view for a 19th century commentator. Uh, that would be Richard Longenecker's view in the word biblical commentary. Uh, so that's a, that's a view that kind of spans the ages there, that this is an allegorical interpretation. Others would argue that he's interpreting typologically. Uh, this would be, uh, say, uh, uh, Chrysostom, John Chrysostom. Uh, this would be J.B. Lightfoot. Uh, this would be F.F. F. Bruce, uh, Timothy George in the NAC. Um, Calvin doesn't use the word typology. He uses the word anagoge, uh, but I think that probably is also his, his position. Fung wants the term analogy over either allegory or typology. Uh, and then others claim that Paul combined typology and allegory. Uh, that would be Thomas Schreiner. Now, some of this debate is semantic. Um, you know, what, what is an allegorical interpretation versus what is a, what is a typological interpretation? And I'm not super concerned about the lexical meaning of the terms typology or, or allegory. Typically, um, typically, typology is rooted more in history. Typology is rooted more in the, the repetition of events of history and so forth, uh, whereas allegory is, is a little more disconnected from the historical. But I think the point at issue really isn't the meaning of which term we put, but what is the actual hermeneutical practice of Paul? This passage is, um, is actually exemplifying. And as I undertook the study, I was asking myself, is this methodology or hermeneutical practice of Paul actually distinct from the patristic and medieval uh, fourfold interpretation? Is it distinct from the patristic approach to allegorical interpretation? And as I work through this, I think we'll see that the answer to that is yes. So verse 21 uh, sets the stage. Let me grab a Bible. Get a Bible in front of me here. Verse 21 sets the stage. Uh, Paul concludes his argument against whether the Galatians who wish to submit themselves to the law by asking whether they consider what the law actually says about being under the law. So here are these people, they wanna, they, they're saying, at least the Judaizers among them are saying, it's necessary to be circumcised in order to be justified, in order to be saved. They're gonna bring themselves back under the Mosaic law, and Paul says, okay, have you thought about what the law actually says about being under the law? And then verses uh, 20, uh, verses 23, 22 and 23, they direct the readers back uh, to the Abraham narrative. But the son of the slave was born, or for it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, one by a free woman. The son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman uh, was born through promise. In its original setting, Genesis, uh, in Genesis, this narrative is actually about the promises of God and the response of Abraham uh, to these promises with growing faith. Um, one of the things that helped me actually understand this passage, I had that question that I asked in, um, that I asked my, my professor, uh, how I got that question answered was actually through a, a study of Genesis. And I was studying through Genesis, uh, in this case, 16, and I thought, you know, this, this passage in its context uh, really is all about God's promises and about responding to these promises by faith. And we find New Testament confirmation that, that, that faith is a major emphasis of the Abraham narrative. In both Galatians 3 and Romans 4, Paul appears, appeals to Abraham to undergird his argument that justification is by faith alone. In Hebrews 11, the portion discussing Abraham's faith runs from verses, verse 8 to verse 19, giving Abraham the longest section in this chapter on faith. Uh, and specifically, Hebrews 11 is on faith as it relates to works. 
Uh, the, there are only two other extended discussions of Abraham in the New Testament. One is found in John 8, concerning the Pharisees' claim to be Abraham's children, and the other is in Hebrews 7, which deals with Melchizedek. So I think when we look at Genesis in the original context, the Abraham narratives in their original context, and when we look at uh, how the New Testament um, talks about these, these passages, uh, we see that faith is a major theme of, in the original context that Paul is drawing on. Now, in Galatians 4, Paul specifically highlights Abraham's two sons, and he highlights Abraham's two sons to exemplify two ways in which Abraham sought to receive the promises. Galatia, uh, Genesis 16 records the birth of Abraham's first son. Now, in, the, in 15, in the previous chapter, Abram reminded the Lord of both the seed promise and of his lack of children. That's Genesis 15, uh, 2 and 3. God, in verses 4 and 5, then reaffirms the seed promise. And then he, further, he makes a further specification. The seed promise is actually going to be fulfilled by Abram himself having a son. This is not going to be through adoption of your servant and his heirs. You are going to actually have a son, Abram, God says. In verse 6, Abram uh, believes God, and God counts him to righteousness. Come to chapter 16 of Genesis, and it opens, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. So if Abram's going to have children, it's his wife who's going to bear them, and yet Yahweh, the giver of the promise, actually had prevented Sarah from having children. And Calvin actually suggests that by this stage, Sarah had reached the point where she knew she was physically incapable of bearing children. And so here they are. God's promised Abram, you're going to have children. They're going to be your own children. He has a wife, and they realize she can't have children. It's, it's physically incapable for her to have children. Now, verse 1 provides a possible way out of this dilemma. Uh, Sarai had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Now, the passage is clear uh, that this is not God's way of fulfilling the promise. When Abraham had previously consulted with God about the servant being the key to fulfilling the promise, God rejected that solution, uh, Genesis 15, 4. But ominously, in Genesis 16, God actually isn't consulted at all. Unlike 15, where, where Abram goes to God and says, let my servant fulfill this promise, God is completely left out of the picture here in Genesis chapter 16. Moses also uses language in Genesis 16 that draws the reader's mind back to Genesis 3. So here's Genesis 16, 2. And Abraham listened to the voice of Sarai. Listen to uh, Gen uh, Genesis 3, 17. Adam listened to the voice of his wife. In fact, the phrase that this, phrase, that this uh, verse listened to is that it could also be translated obey. That occurs only here and in Genesis 3.17. Uh, I think that's suggestive enough as far as Moses drawing a parallel. But more than that, in both instances, it's a question of obeying one's wife, which is, uh, you know, it is always good for men to take um, the counsel of their wives, uh, in, when it's, especially when it's wise biblical counsel. I, I, I often talk with my wife about like real, if it's a major decision, we always talk about it. But here we actually do see a reversal of the leadership that Adam is supposed to be leading, taking in the home, or Abraham is supposed to be taking in the home. In this case, the counsel is wrong counsel, and the husband is actually obeying uh, the wife in giving that, uh, that wrong counsel. Also, here's, uh, here's Genesis 3, 6. Eve took and gave to her husband. In Genesis 16.3, Sarah took and gave to her husband. Uh, between these two verses, there's actually, between Genesis uh, 16.2 and, uh, uh, 16, and 3 and Genesis 3.6, uh, there's actually an identical sequence of key nouns and verbs. And it's actually not even just the terminology that's similar, but the actions that are involved in similar. So I think Moses writes into the beginning of Genesis 16 here an echo of the fall narrative 
in uh, Genesis chapter 3. In both cases, God's word was not believed, and humans took matters into their own hands. Now, I'll qualify that a little bit in terms of Genesis 16. In the case of Hagar, Genesis 16, God's word wasn't entirely disbelieved. Because if God's word was entirely disbelieved, Abram and Sarah wouldn't even be trying to, to fulfill God's promise. Um, but instead, what they're doing is they're trying to fulfill God's promise through their own efforts. So Kelvin says, the faith of both of them was defective, not indeed with regard to the substance of the promise. They actually believed that there would be a son that would come from this, that would fill the promise. But with regard to the method by which they proceeded, since they hastened to acquire the offspring, which was to be expected from God without observing the legitimate ordinance of God. And I think that's exactly the issue in Galatians, right? Galatians is not about people disbelieving God entirely. It's, it's not about unbelievers. It's about people that, have, that are combining faith uh, with their own efforts. They're trying to achieve the promises of God that they do believe in, but they're also using their own efforts. In, in the Galatians case, circumcision, food laws, and so forth, uh, in, order to, um, in order to achieve the promise of God. And so in Galatians 4.23, um, Paul says the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, which I don't think refers to the sinful manner in which, um, in which Ishmael was conceived. It means that Ishmael was born of human contriving. Um, it probably means more than simply he was born according to the natural process of, of procreation, although that meaning would be included. Uh, it, I think it means that this was a human effort. This was human effort on the part of um, on the part of, of Abram and Sarai to bring about uh, the promises of God. Now, let's contrast this with the birth of, of Isaac. So Genesis 21 records the birth of Abraham's second son. In this passage, Moses specifically said that Isaac was born, quote, as he had promised, that is, as God had promised. And he reinforces the fulfillment, um, he reinforces the fulfillment of the promise by noting that the birth took place, quote, as he had said. That's again 21.1. And further, 21.2, at the time of which God had spoken to him. So Moses emphasizes the Lord's involvement in the birth of Isaac, Isaac again, by, by specifying that the Lord had visited Sarah, a term that denotes God's special involvement. Uh, Abraham's personal righteousness had nothing to do with the fulfillment of the promise, because if you go back in the previous chapter, he had failed once again. That was when he was down in Philistia, and he lied again about Sarah being his wife. Uh, so again, he had, he had just had a major failure. You know, he's not getting this fulfillment because he's been extra righteous up to this point. And then his old age is noted in 21, 1, 5, and 7, which is, again, another indication that God fulfilled this promise. So it's on the basis of this passage uh, that Paul says in Galatians 4.23, the son of the free woman was born uh, through the promise. So I think the circumstances of the birth of Abraham's two sons parallel the options before the Galatians. They could seek to achieve the promises of God through human effort, or they can trust God to bring about what he's promised. And Paul exploits this parallel by a figurative, by figurative language that draws out further parallels between the mothers of these sons and the two covenants and so forth. But before we get into that, does that, did everyone follow the argument up to this point? How looking back at Genesis 16, in its original context and its original meaning, and Genesis 21, in its original context and original meaning, actually informs what Paul is doing in, um, in Galatians uh, 23, 4.23, when he talks about the son of the slave woman born according to the flesh, the son of the free woman born according to the promise. Okay, I'm getting positive feedback here, so I'm going to keep pressing forward unless someone raises a, raises a question here. Very good. Um, okay, so I, I've mentioned that, that these two represent two covenants, and I'm, 
Uh, that's uh, actually what Paul says in verse 24. Now, these, these may be interpreted allegorically, or these may be interpreted figuratively, or this, these may be used as an illustration. All of these are, are possible translations of that term. And then what, what is this, what is this um, kind of figurative interpretation that, that Paul is using, or this, these figures of speech that Paul is going to make use of here, these illustrative uh, examples? Well, this is, this is it. These women are two covenants. So we just looked at uh, the Hagar narrative in Genesis 16. So Hagar is actually going to stand for that narrative, I think. And she is going to represent uh, the Mosaic covenant. And Sarah, in the narrative that she represents from uh, Genesis chapter 21, she is going to represent uh, the new covenant. I think the associations that, that uh, Paul makes with Hagar Mount Sinai makes a real clear connection uh, to the Mosaic covenant. Then Paul also says that she is connected with the present Jerusalem, which I think probably refers to that whole legal system of Judaism. Uh, that was all located in uh, Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. That's where kind of the center of, of Judaism uh, was. Um, some people, this would be Bruce and Schreiner, they favor identifying the present Jerusalem with the Judaizers. But I think it's probably best to keep the connection to the Mosaic system. I think that keeps a tighter connection between the symbols that Paul is piling up. That would allow Hagar, Mount Sinai, present Jerusalem to all mean the same thing. So I think it, I, I like to keep that symbolism there, or those terms that get piled up uh, tightly connected uh, with one another. The Judaizers will enter the picture because they seek to impose the Mosaic system on Christians. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that's, I, I'd like to keep those, those uh, symbols kind of tightly connected and then bring the Judaizers in at the appropriate place. Uh, regarding the mention of Arabia, I think Paul may signify that those under the Mosaic Covenant hadn't entered, uh, have not entered into the promises of God. Uh, you know, they're, they're still maybe out in the wilderness. They haven't entered into the promised land. That's a, that's a possible um, interpretation. Ritter Boss, uh, however, prefers to understand this verse as saying, although Sinai is in Arabia, Hagar is nevertheless to be um, identified with the present Jerusalem. Mm, I don't know. Uh, I, I think I would lean towards the, towards the former, but that's not a, uh, that's not a decisive thing. Uh, Duncan notes that Luther sees present Jerusalem as effectively Romanism. I think that would be similar uh, to seeing it as Judaism, uh, Ju the, as the Judaizers. Uh, Romanism would be kind of his application there. Uh, and again, I'd like to keep these symbols tightly or tighter together uh, to refer to actually the Mosaic Covenant. Jews that Judaizers are connected with that because they want to impose that Mosaic Covenant on, on the people. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Dr. Harnell said, for, uh, everything is Rome for Luther. So, so Luther gets a big, a bit of a knock on that. Uh, I don't want to be too hard on Luther, because I do think he is applying the Bible to his uh, present-day circumstance. And I don't, think that, I don't think that application is as far off as he's uh, as it's sometimes made out to be. So, okay, the New Covenant... So I said that, that um, Hagar and all the symbols associated with her refer to the Mosaic Covenant. And I said Sarah, and these, sim these symbols, uh, the symbol may not be the right word, but these other words that are associated with her are tied to the New Covenant. The covenant symbolized by Sarah actually isn't clearly identified. So interpreters actually differ. Is this actually the New Covenant or is it the Abrahamic Covenant? Uh, Schreiner favors identifying it with the New Covenant. But he says it's not really of major importance since the new covenant is the one that fulfills the Abrahamic covenant. And I actually think that observation favors the new covenant identification. Um, if, if the new covenant is the one that fulfills the Abrahamic covenant, uh, it's probably the covenant that's ultimately in fulfillment that's, that's in view. Furthermore, the Galatian churches are Gentile churches, and they become the seed of Abraham and beneficiaries of aspects of of the Abrahamic covenant because of their union to the seed of Abraham. That's the whole point of Galatians 3, 27 to 29. And that union to the seed, to Christ, 
happens only through the new covenant sacrifice of Christ. Uh, so I, I think new covenant is probably the best identification there. Sarah is also identified with the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, Aquinas. Uh, so that was the church triumphant. Calvin said it was the church militant. I don't think it's either of those. I think it's probably the future Jerusalem. This is the Jerusalem from which Christ establishes his righteous reign over all the earth. Some aspects of that righteous reign have actually begun with the inauguration of the new covenant, uh, but its consummation awaits the future. Um, and I think the support for that is pretty good in, um, in Longenecker. And, and I'm, he has a whole series of uh, references, both from biblical and Jewish literature, some more convincing than others, uh, that would make that case. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce's commentary uh, on this section also makes that identification. I think Longenecker and Bruce are, are on the right track there. Okay, so we have uh, Paul, he's looking back to Genesis uh, 16 and 21. That's the exegetical grounding of, these, uh, of, uh, of the parallels that he's making. And then he's piling up imagery in connection with uh, Sarah, or Hag Hagar and Sarah. And, um, <clears throat> and, and then he's using this to identify uh, these two ways of proceeding that we see in Genesis 16 and 21 with actually the two covenants, with the Mosaic covenant and with the new covenant. Now, the connection between the Judaizers and the Mosaic law, I think, is self-evident. I think everybody's going to make that connection. Um, so uh, the Judaizers uh, are the ones that are saying we have to go back and, and live under the Mosaic law. So, so yeah, that's a clear connection. But Paul actually has to demonstrate the connection between the Galatians, the Galatians Christian, the Galatian Christians, and Sarah, the free woman, the new covenant, the Jerusalem above. That whole complex of ideas. So Sarah, the free woman, the new covenant, the Jerusalem above. How how do you demonstrate that that really is uh, the the true Galatian Christians? How do you demonstrate that that connection there? There's a gar in. Uh, Let's see, which verse is this? Uh, verse 27, it indicates that Paul is grounding his claim on uh, verse 26, but the Jerusalem above, she is free, she is our mother. He's grounding that with the quotations that follow. And the passage he quotes is Isaiah 54, 1. What's great about that passage is it ties together the Abrahamic covenant, the new covenant, and Gentile salvation while also having a nice verbal connection with the word barren. So Isaiah alludes to the Abrahamic covenant in Isaiah 54, 1 through 3. He alludes to the Mosaic covenant in, in uh, 54, 4 through 8. And actually, he alludes to the Noahic covenant in 54, 9 through 17, the Davidic covenant in 55, 3 through 5. But he, he alludes to those in terms of their fulfillment in the new covenant. And you can tell that by comparing Isaiah 54.10 with Ezekiel 34.5, Ezekiel 37.26, and other of these passages. Let's actually, let's actually turn back to Isaiah 54. I think it'll be helpful to get our eyes on that, um, that passage. What's, what's great about what I just said is that when Paul is, is, is a quoting from this passage here, it's not just a random quotation. It's not just that this word barren shows up in this passage, and it's not a nice verbal connection. I think that's there. But Paul is actually taking us back to an Old Testament passage that, uh, that really has all these allusions to all of the major biblical covenants. And so he's really taking us to a key, to a key passage. So Isaiah 54, 1 through 3, Sing, O barren one who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of a desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. As I read that, I, I'm hoping that you have in your mind all kinds of connections back to the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, that are that are kind of showing up. It's it's there elusively in terms of the barren one having children, but it's there explicitly 
in terms of promises, your offspring will possess the nations. That's an Abrahamic covenant uh, promise. So Abrahamic covenant is, uh, is really shouting here. Uh, Mosaic covenant gets alluded to in verses 4 through 8. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced, for you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and grieved in spirit, like the wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God. For a moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger, for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now the Mosaic Covenant illusions there may not be quite so shouting to you, uh, but this idea of, of God being the Redeemer, uh, he redeemed them out of Egypt, is showing up there, and the idea of a more conditional covenant, where he is, he is the, um, you know, somebody that, you know, they're in, a, they're in a condition where they can be deserted and uh, cast off. You have in the Mosaic Covenant, the covenant blessings and the covenant curses for, uh, for disobedience. And so I think that's going on uh, here in this, in this, in this passage. It, it, it is the Mosaic Covenant where they are both deserted and uh, and then um, there's promises of restoration also in uh, the Mosaic uh, Covenant. Um, and then, let's see here, the Noahic Covenant shows up in 9 through 17. Uh, this is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore... <coughs> that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. And that really con continues, that illusion continues really all the way down um, to verse 17. Um, now 55 is continuing, chapter 55 of Isaiah is actually continuing. It's part of the same section. And if you look down to chapter 55, verses 3, and uh, three through five, incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast and sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So that is Davidic covenant. But it's using a new covenant formula there. Uh, the everlasting covenant is a term that is used really throughout the prophets um, of the uh, of the uh, of the Abrahamic, or sorry, of the new covenant. So I think you can see in this passage here, uh, Isaiah is bringing together all of these all of these covenants. Now let's focus on what Paul's doing here with this. Verse 1 connects to the Abrahamic covenant by speaking of Zion in terms, this is Isaiah uh, 54, 1. Connects with the Abrahamic covenant by speaking of Zion in terms of a barren woman having offspring. Um, Isaiah 54, 1 and Genesis eleven thirty 30 are parallel in Hebrew, and especially in the Septuagint, which, was, which is what Paul was quoting. So I think there's actually an explicit connection there. Um, so it, it's Zion is a barren woman having offspring. Sarah was a barren woman having offspring. These connections continue with the reference to spreading abroad to the right hand to the left hand in 54.3, which actually calls to mind Genesis uh, 28.14. Uh, let me turn to that real quick so we get that in front of us. Uh, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south, and in your, you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I think Paul is actually alluding uh, to that passage here. Notice that Genesis 28, 14 not only promises numerous offspring to Abraham, but it also says that the, the, um, the blessing of Abraham's seed would be to all the families of the earth. And Isaiah brings these two ideas together in his exhortation to Zion to enlarge her tent because her seed 
will possess uh, the nations. Now, a lot of commentators on Isaiah interpret this passage in terms of Israel conquering cities uh, from the surrounding nations. A lot of times after the exile, they're saying, oh, after the exile, they're going to come back, they're going to conquer cities around the nations. I don't think contextually that's most likely. I think in context, Isaiah is showing how the Abrahamic covenant is taken up and fulfilled in the new covenant. Um, because, you know, he's bringing all these, all these passages together. And where does he culminate in chapter 55? He culminates in, in seeing a new covenant fulfillment. So I think, I think what Isaiah is saying is, okay, these Abrahamic promises, they're going to be fulfilled in the new covenant, uh, which I think would rule out a post-exilic expansion theme. Uh, because the new covenant comes subsequent to the to the uh, post exile, uh, the return from exile. Um, a lot of these commentators, I think, they over rely on on connecting this to passages in Deuteronomy that speak of the Canaanites driving the or speaks of the Israelites driving the Canaanites from the land. Um, the Deuteronomy parallels they don't fit the new covenant context of this passage. And I don't think they fit the emphasis in this section on the salvation of the Gentiles. Uh, Isaiah 49.1, Isaiah 49.22-23, Isaiah 51.4-5, Isaiah 52.7-10, Isaiah 54.5, Isaiah 55.1, Isaiah 55.4, Isaiah 56.3, Isaiah 56, 6, those are all passages about the salvation of the Gentiles. So I don't really see a, a, an emphasis here about the conquest of Canaan or even a reconquest of Canaan in the, even in the broader context here. The broader context here is about uh, the salvation of, uh, of the Gentiles. Also, I think there's a close connection between Isaiah 50, 54 and Isaiah 49, 14 through 23. So Isaiah 49, 14 to 23 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And God replies, Can a woman forget her nursing child, that she should have no compassion on the, on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will, yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have engraven you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your builders make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste go out from you. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather and they come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does. Surely your waste and your desolate places, your devastated land. Surely now you'll be too narrow for your inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children of your bereavement will say, yet say in your ears, the place is too narrow for me. Make room for me to dwell in. Then you will say in your heart, Who has borne me these? I was bereaved and barren, exiled and put away. But who has brought up these? Behold, I was alone, left alone. Where have these come from? Okay, so you can see already there the connections between Isaiah 49 and Isaiah 54. There's a lot of, there's a lot of resonance between these passages. Notice where, where Isaiah 49 goes. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and raise my signal to the peoples, and they shall bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, queens your nursing mothers. With their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. So there's, there's Gentile inclusion there in that passage. Uh, so that parallel, I think, is pointing to something other than uh, post-exilic conquest. Actually, the closest parallel um, to, um, to this phrase, let's see here, I have to get this back in my view, uh, possess the nations. The closest parallel to, to that in Isaiah 54, 3 is actually Amos 9, 11, and 12. Uh, Amos 9, 11 and 12 says, In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess, that's our term, the remnant of Edom and all the nations. Those are the two key words from Isaiah 54 that show up here in Amos 9, 
11 and 12, the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord who does this. So the emphasis in Amos is on Israel possessing all the nations. Edom is given there as a concrete example and perhaps as a syndicate for the phrase all the nations. That's what uh, Douglas Stewart says in, uh, in his word biblical commentary on, this, on the Amos passage. Now, it's very interesting that the Lord identifies these nations as called by my name. This indicates that these nations aren't simply coming under Israelite hegemony. They actually become one with God's people. In other words, these nations, they don't, they don't have to become proselytes. They don't have to become Jews to become part of God's nation, uh, to become God, part of God's people, as was true in the Old Testament period. There's a future period in which the nations themselves as nations, as still as Gentiles, will become one uh, with God's people. And of course, it's the Apostle James in, uh, who appeals to Amos 9.11 to make the same point that Paul is making in Galatians. Circumcision and obedience to the law of Moses aren't necessary for salvation. Um, why is James making that point? Well, James is making the point that, um, that with, with Christ, the, the booth of David that Amos refers to there, the, 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 the dynasty of David is, is being is begun to be rebuilt. And that's another way of saying we've entered into the new covenant fulfillment. And in this era, the Gentiles can be called by God's name without being, without being proselytes. Um, what, what's really neat about this is um, what's really neat about this is you can see that the that the passage that that James goes to to make the same point that Paul's making in Genesis is a parallel to the passage that Paul goes to. These passages are linked. And so you can see that there's something, um, there's something really uh, in these passages. That's what these passages are about. That Paul, in other words, Paul and James are going to the key passages. And, and, and the fact that they go to parallel passages reinforce, uh, reinforces uh, that, uh, that idea. Um, so back to Isaiah uh, 54. Let's see if I can get this back. Okay, so, so Isaiah brings these ideas together, the ideas of the numerous offspring and the blessing of Abraham's seed being to all the families of the earth. He brings those together with his exhortation in 54, 2 and 3, for Zion to a larger tent because her seed will possess the nations. By the way, this was William Carey's verse uh, for missions, and I think he interpreted the verse right. This is about bringing all the Gentiles into, uh, into the people of God. This will happen not only by natural means, as when a married woman has children, but it will actually be a supernatural work uh, like a deserted barren woman who has never been in labor having more children than a married woman. I mean, that, you know, that just doesn't happen. So who's going to have more children? The married woman or the woman who's deserted, barren, and has never been in labor? If the, if the deserted, barren woman who's never been in labor has more children than the married woman, something, something supernatural has happened there. Okay, so that is why Paul can conclude that the Galatians, like Isaac, are children of promise. Verse, verse 28. So he, you know, he's saying, okay, one is, is, uh, is from um, the, the son of the free woman was born through promise. And um, Jerusalem above, she is free. She is our mother. Well, well, how do I demonstrate this? Well, it's just what Isaiah was saying. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth, cry aloud, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those who has a husband. That's a promise about all the Gentiles being brought into the people of God. That's what the Galatians were. The Galatians were Gentiles who were brought into the people of God in the New Covenant. So that's why Paul concludes in verse 28, Now you, brothers, like Isaac, our children of promise. Does everyone follow that connection? How Paul is actually making that. Um, Paul is actually making that. Um, uh, 
that uh, that argument with that quotation of Isaiah. I mean, so this is where it does start to feel like um, he almost is using, he is almost turning the argument against him in a way because in this ironic way, if you're doing a, a straight at Judaistic interpretation or understanding of salvation or whatever, it's almost like salvation by genetics, right? You know, I'm a descendant of Abraham, I'm okay. And it's like he's flipping it on them in this way to say, um, <laughs> the barren woman, Sarah, <laughs> Uh, she's, you know, Isaac is the genetic progeny of Abraham. And so you can pride yourself on being a descendant of Isaac and through that line, not the Hagar side. And it's like, no, actually, um, I'm going to make that side, the side that is the miraculous, almost non-genetic, non-natural, the miraculous side, which is kind of the way he's turning the argument similar in, similarly in like Romans four and earlier in Galatians, like Abraham is saved by faith. So, you know, you can't go any more Jewish than Abraham. And he's the, he's the very font of coming to salvation by faith. Am I thinking, am I processing that? Or am I, am I even expressing anything that makes sense? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that, uh, I, I, I can see that. Um, my, my, my one hesitation is that the Judaizers weren't saying Gentiles couldn't be believers, couldn't be saved. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and, because Jews always recognized <coughs> Gentiles could be brought into brought to salvation in the Old Testament through through entering the covenant people of God uh, through proselytizing. And what what the problem is is they're they're saying that's that's still necessary. Uh, and not only is it still necessary, but but they also have some idea that that these um ceremonies and so forth have some kind of saving um function uh so even in the old testament circumcision is not what's meriting you any kind of salvation but mm. as a matter of obedience i think that's where the romans 14 weak brothers are um in distinction from the judaizers but Well, Dr. Arnold, is this a good time for a break? Yeah, that's great. It's right on. We're at 8.54, so we can just come back at 9 o'clock or on the hour, okay. wherever your time zone is. So. Yeah, sounds good. All right, thanks. See you all in a bit. We'll just cover that in course. Um, Dr. Arnold, anything you want to say as we? No, this is great. We'll keep on, keep on rolling. Okay, great. So I think what Paul's done up to this point, up to verse 28, chapter 4, he's established the identity of the Galatian Christians. Um, and now he's going to identi identify the identity of the Judaizers. They are like Ishmael for they persecuted those born according to the Spirit. Uh, verse 29, But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. Um, I think also the fact that born through the promise and born according to the Spirit, our parallel phrases also indicates that the covenant of promise in view is, is the new covenant. Um, just just as, as an aside there. Now, this connection is made on the basis of Ishmael's treatment of Isaac in Genesis 2.21.9. And it's interesting, some commentators actually resist the idea that Ishmael actually persecuted Isaac in Genesis 21.9. F.F. Bruce says that laughter is a repeated theme in Genesis 21, and that Ishmael's laughter need not be mocking. And secondly, Bruce says, even if Ishmael's laughter is mockery, that's hardly tantamount to persecution. And Longenecker argues that the Bible nowhere presents Ishmael persecuting Isaac and that Paul was dependent on Jewish tradition for this. I, I really don't like those arguments. I really don't like it when somebody says, well, this New Testament author who's interpreted the Old Testament really doesn't get the Old Testament interpretation right. That just, 
how, how, how do you conclude that? I, I don't know. Um, when you look at the passage, I think the fact that laughter is a key word in Genesis 21 does not mean the chapter must, that is used in the chapter must be uniformly positive. So yes, this is a repeated word in Genesis 21, but that doesn't mean that the word always is used uniformly positive. Uh, both the fact that here it occurs in the PL, which uh, Wenham says gives the word nasty overtones, and the fact that the nature of Sarah's response indicates that Ishmael's laughter was mocking rather than friendly, um, would indicate that this is, this is used differently from the more positive laughter uh, that shows up elsewhere in the passage. In response to, to Bruce's second point, F.F. Bruce's second point, that even if the laughter is understood as mockery, it's hardly tantamount to persecution, I actually think that Kelvin here is more insightful. This is what Kelvin says in his Genesis commentary on this passage. He says, and there is no doubt that his manifest impiety against God betrayed itself under this ridicule. He had reached an age at which he could not by any means be ignorant of the promised favor on account of which his father Abraham was transported with so great joy. And yet profoundly confident in himself, he insults in the person of his brother, both God and his word, as well as the faith of Abraham. Furthermore, at Matthew 5.11, Jesus himself is willing to call verbal abuse persecution. And Peter, in 1 Peter 1, 1.4, develops verbal abuse. Actually, it's in that verse, but it's, it's, he develops it throughout the book as a sub-theme under the dominant suffering motif. So I think Paul is indeed referring to Genesis 21. Uh, and I think that renders Longnecker's theory that he's dependent on Jewish tradition, superfluous as well as unduly speculative. 21.9. That's what Paul is referring to here, Isaac's mocking persecution of Ishmael, or of Isaac. Ishmael's mocking persecution of Isaac. Okay, so Paul then applies the judgment that falls on those aligned with Ishmael, that is, those under the Mosaic Code. They won't receive the promised inheritance. And Paul gives this warning based on the words of Sarah, Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman, Genesis, Galatians 4.30. Now, this has traditionally been read to say that the Galatians should exclude unconverted Jews from their midst. The church father, Ambrio Zotter, uh, took that position. Thomas Aquinas took that position. Uh, DeWitt Burton in the ICC commentary, that was his position. More recently, it has been read to say that they should um, that they should exclude the Judaizers. And that's what Longenecker and George read. Now, there are numerous passages that, that do teach that false teachers should be expelled from the church, even in Galatians. Galatians 1 and 8, 9, 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 7, 1, 2 John 10 through 11. But in the flow of Paul's argument, I think this quotation seems to be warning, seems to be a warning that fits with Paul's opening admonition. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? What he's saying here is submission to the law results in being cast out from the family of promise. I think that's Paul's point here. Submission to the law, especially in this Judaizing way, results in being cast out of the family of promise. If you're going to put yourself back under the Mosaic Code for salvation, you will not receive uh, the promised inheritance. In verse 31, Paul reiterates the conclusion that he reached in verse 28 about the identity of the Christians. So verse 31, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but we are children of the free woman. And then let's move right on into 5.1. There were no chapter breaks in the original. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again uh, to a yoke of slavery. So 5.1, he concludes his exhortation, and he prepares the way for the following section by exhorting the Galatians to stand firm in their freedom and not to submit to the slavery of the Mosaic Code. Now, throughout this passage, I think what Paul is doing, let, so let's, let, actually, let's stop there and ask questions. Does anyone have questions? Because we're at the end of the exegesis section of, the, of, of, of this. Any questions about 
uh, about any of the exegesis of this. Are you reading in verse 25? Um, I just read that earlier today. There's a variant there, and so you can just read. Uh, now Mount Sinai is in Arabia. So it's possible that Hagar is not there at all in verse 25. How, how are you reading that? Or Yeah, so I gave a couple options. It probably wasn't clear when I read that. Um, so Paul may signify that those under the Mosaic Covenant have not entered into the promises of God. That's Calvin and Schreiner. Or Ritterboss is understanding the verse as saying, although Sinai is in Arabia, Hagar is nonetheless to be identified with the present Jerusalem. I think that's what the reading that you're going with. Um, and I thought I had a note there on the variant. I don't think I actually took a position on, on that one way or the other. Um, I don't actually see a note in my note where I took a position on the variant. I think I just gave those two options. Right, Is that satisfying? Thanks. Yeah. yeah it's so Brian asks, Is the casting an act of God <clears throat> and not of the church? Um, And just to clarify, it sounds like you're saying it is God excluding them from the family of God rather than in, he's not calling on the church to exclude specific people. Uh, just I was wondering about the specific force of this. this verse. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, um, yeah, there are passages that say, you know, false teachers need to be cast out for the church. But I don't think that's what this passage is saying. And I think in the flow of Paul's argument, this is a this is a warning about, um, yes, they won't be part of the family of promise, and that's a divine, yeah, that's, that is how I would read that. Could you explain um, the, the different views on the New Jerusalem? So, uh, like, uh, there's the church militant, church triumphant, and then the, your New Covenant view. Uh, I, was not a, I was not familiar with the old interpretations there at all. Yes, let me uh, see if I can find that spot in my notes. Um, hmm, it shouldn't be this hard to find <laughs> that section in my notes. Okay, here we go. So this is in chapter uh, ver uh, uh, verse 26, the Jerusalem that is above. Um, so the heavenly Jerusalem, Aquinas is saying it's the church triumphant. And, and you could see why he would make that connection, because the church that is above uh, would seem to be uh, the church that is you know, already ascended up into heaven. They're the church triumphant. Um, Calvin identifies it with the church militant. And I'd have to actually go back, and I could do that right now if you wanted me to. I could uh, pull that up uh, and see what he's after there. But he may be saying, you know, we're in, uh, you know, we're already seated above in heavenly places, e Ephesians. I'm just speculating here on what he might be saying. So it, it includes the church militant right now. Um... What, what I, where I would go with that is um, the Jerusalem that is above actually comes down from heaven. Uh, it's the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth. So I, I'm not inclined. See, see I think, I think what, what Calvin and Aquinas are doing is they're assuming that Jerusalem, that they already have an assumption that Jerusalem means church. Uh, and of course, in the way that this imagery is, is working, Jerusalem is being, the Jerusalem above is being connected with believers in the new covenant. But, but I think they already have in their mind uh, a Jerusalem equals church connection. And so what I'm saying is actually that, that's kind of jumping ahead of the game a little bit here. 
that we need to we need to understand what Jerusalem above uh, is in the uh, in its symbolic meaning here before we attach the referent of the church to it, if that makes sense. And well, what is the Jerusalem above? Well, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven to earth, that would be the Jerusalem above. It's some aspects of, of Christ's righteous reign from Jerusalem have already begun with the new covenant. So that's that's my thinking. That's my thinking there. So we're doing something like a... Um... Yeah, I mean, it's like an eschatological focus, but there's, it's through an already not yet grid, almost a Colossians 3 sort of concept, like you're seated with Christ, but you're putting it through the lens of already not yet in other ways. Correct. And uh, I just pulled, I just pulled Longenecker, Longenecker off my shelf. Um. It's been a little while since I actually looked at at because uh, I, I, I developed this is actually developed out of my dissertation so it's been a number of years since I've actually gone back and checked some of these footnotes. Long and Ector says reference to a heavenly Jerusalem are to be found <clears throat> in embryonic form in the Jewish scriptures. Psalm 87 3 Isaiah 54 uh, which is interesting because Paul quotes from that Ezekiel 40 48 and he says in Jewish wisdom literature uh, and in apocalyptic writings of the second temple. Now I noted in my footnote, some of these references are more convincing than others. Um, this concept of a heavenly or new Jerusalem also epitomized the hopes of Jewish Christians, uh, where the full realization of God's kingdom and Christ's reign is set out in terms of a heavenly or new Jerusalem that was looked forward to by the patriarchs and is now experienced by Christians in inaugurated fashion. So I was Kind of building so, off of long and echo there so is the what the is the connection then between the new jerusalem and the new covenant um kenneth in the chat is talking about the land promise um is that the connection or is there something else um let me pull up the chat so i can keep <laughs> keep up with that um and then, re, can you now that I've looked at that comment, can you restate your question again? I'm just wondering what the connection is between New Jerusalem and uh, New Covenant. Yeah, those New Covenant promises uh, ultimately would find their fulfillment um, in the New Jerusalem. I mean, that's that's a, a key component of, of the fulfillment of those promises. Um, so I would see kind of an already not yet there uh, going on with, with its being brought up here as well. Um, there's the present Jerusalem. That's where all the sacrifices and, and things tied to the old covenant would be, uh, verse 25. And then the Jerusalem from above, that's the one we're expecting to come down out of heaven to consummate all of these new covenant promises, or at least in part would consummate the new covenant promises um, so that would be identified with the new covenant people of God. Does that make sense? Any, any further questions on that? Uh, that makes sense to me now. And uh, I, I was just taken back when I was reading Luther um, and he talks about all the medieval stuff um, and, and he sort of, he attacks Aquinas basically. And then picks the church militant theme, assumes that that's the interpretation and moves on. And basically he's allegorizing Galatians four here. Yes. And I think he's not doing it too much. Like, I don't think he's doing damage to the text, but it's, it's very different from the modern commentaries when you're reading it. Yeah. Luther, I don't know if this is what's going on here, but Luther makes, makes pretty tight connections between the Juda Judaizers and the Roman Catholics of his day, and I don't, he gets, he kind of gets uh, criticized for that in a lot of the modern literature, but I, I tend to think that that modern literature, the biblical scholars aren't necessarily up on their historical theology, maybe, uh, because it wasn't that Rome denied grace, or that salvation was by grace. Uh, Rome affirms that salvation is, ju and justification is by grace, but it's by grace in conjunction with the sacramental system, 
And I think Luther is rightly recognizing, well, wait a second, if it's by grace in conjunction with the sacrificial system, how is that different from the Judaizers who are saying it's by grace plus uh, in conjunction with the Mosaic system? I mean, I think, I think Luther is picking up on a, real, on a real parallel there. Now, rhetorically, he, he, might, he might not show you all the moves he's making. You know, he's going to make that connection rhetorically pretty tight. Um, so, but uh, Kenneth Chung asked, is, is Luther correct about the church militant? No, I don't think he's correct in that particular point. Um, I, I'm just defending him more broadly. Is it reasonable to do something with the, the present Jerusalem versus the Jerusalem above is free? Like having a little bit of a polemical edge to it in a way. Like, so you claim on the Judaizer side, you claim to be the authentic, authentic Judaism. The Jerusalem above, almost like a Hebrews nine sort of notion, like the real, the you yeah. know, the real seat of where all of this stuff is is actually above now, um, or we ought to think right. of it. You know, that's the ultimate sanctuary kind of notion. Is that yeah, you, am yeah, I thinking the right yeah, direction? Yeah, it's kind of like you, you just have the present Jerusalem, but we have the new Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. So yeah, I think there's something of that there. Excellent questions. Other other questions. We have a little more to tie things together at the end here, but but I, uh, if we have interpret uh, questions on the interpretation, let's get those uh, worked through. Um, I, I see a question here in the uh, from Aguinaldo Angeles. Uh, is the casting out something to do with Romans eleven one? Uh, Eleven fifteen. I had not thought of that connection, um, but I could see that as a valid connection. Well, if there is nothing, nothing else, let's let's wrap this up, kind of tie this together, and look at our initial question. Our initial question is: Is Paul uh, doing something that we ought not to do? Uh, uh, is he interpreting allegorically in a way that we ought not to interpret, or is Paul's interpretation actually justifying uh, an allegorical approach to Scripture, like what uh, the the church fathers and the medieval church did? Is that something? Is that a method of interpretation that we should seek to re to to recover uh, in the present day? And you know, Paul here is justifying that. Well, throughout the passage, uh, Paul is explaining surface similarities. Hagar's bondage, the bondage of the law, Sarah's freedom, freedom of the new covenant, Sarah's barrenness and the latter and later fecundity with Zion's barrenness and later fecundity to illustrate aspects of his present situation. But when we probed these surface similarities, we found out that they had deeply rooted substantive connections. And I think, I, I hope we really saw that as we dug into uh, to Genesis 16, Genesis 21, Isaiah 54, that what Paul's drawing on out of the Old Testament, he is really capturing the, the main ideas of those passages. Um, it's these roots uh, that set Paul's practice in this passage apart from, I think, the allegories of the patristic and medieval eras. So, for instance, Augustine actually he extends Paul's allegory uh, to apply to Abraham's children by Keturah. Um, he says this, he says, now if someone has gained confidence from the apostles' very clear demonstration that these two sons are to be understood allegorically and also wishes to see Keturah's sons. Now, just to clarify, uh, after Sarah died, Abram married, actually, there's some debate about that, but it occurs in the text after Sarah's death. He married a woman named Keturah, and, and, and the text get, notes that they also had additional, additional sons. So uh, Augustine is saying, okay, Paul set a precedent here. Uh, Ishmael and Isaac get, in, get to be interpreted allegorically. Let's, let's do some allegor allegorical interpretation with Keturah's sons. So he says, if someone wishes to see Keturah's sons as some figure of things to come, for these events involving such persons were not recorded of the Holy Spirit for nothing, he will perhaps find that they signify heresies and schisms. They are indeed sons of a free woman, uh, as uh, are the sons of the church, and yet they were born according to the flesh, not spiritually through the promise. 
But if so, they are also found not to belong to the inheritance, that is the heavenly Jerusalem, which the scripture calls barren, because for a long time she did not bear sons on the earth. So according to, according to Augustine, uh, the sons of Keturah represented heresies and schisms. Now, Augustine's allegory does make superficial connections, but I think an examination of Genesis 25 would reveal that it lacks the roots of Paul's allegory. Genesis 25 is not about heresies and schisms uh, the way that Genesis 16 is about seeking to achieve the promise apart from faith or, or, or uh, by adding faith to works. Um, and... Uh, so I, I, I think the great difference between what Paul did in, in later allegories, uh, as well as the uniqueness of this passage, ought to caution interpreters uh, against using it as a justification for a wholesale adoption of an allegorical method of, uh, of interpretation. I think uh, Mosiah Silva provides a good evaluation. He says, we have no evidence um, to confirm this theory that, that we should use this as a uh, as a uh, a method for our interpretation, and the text itself gives no clear indication to support that this we should adopt kind of a patristic uh, allegorical allegorical interpretation. But the possibility should be left open. In any case, the very fact that Paul nowhere else uses this approach, First Corinthians ten four provides only a partial analogy should be a warning against drawing major conclusions on the basis of Paul's use of the Sarah Hagar analogy. I think that's probably fair. Um, my, my, my personal view is that Paul, can provide, Paul does provide for us a model for how we ought to interpret scripture. Um, but that he is he's speaking here figuratively he's not really he's not really given us a, a medieval or patristic allegory and so to tr try to build a case for that approach from this passage uh would be unwise any any other questions about that maybe in particular but it's it's very helpful thank you um, so we have about half an hour left, and I'm wondering, Dr. Arnold, about uh, 1 Corinthians 10.4. You know, oh, I would love that. Okay, but I'm seeing some other questions come in. Um, so when I, I use the allegorical approach to interpret other portions of Scripture, um, and is he doing something more symbolic than typological? Yeah, so I, I think what Paul is doing here, um, in terms of the exegesis, I don't think there's anything, any reason I wouldn't use Paul's exegetical approach here. But what, what throws us is, is Paul is speaking in terms of figures of speech. Um, he, so he's, he's speaking, he's using some figures. So he, he, he takes this, par his, this, uh, this, um, he takes this, uh, these passages and he kind of lets Hagar stand for a whole passage and Sarah stand for a whole passage. And then he brings in these other, um, I don't think there's any problem with that as long as you're clear. You know, if you're speaking rhetorically, uh, the danger would be always, you know, are, are you being as clear as, as Paul is being here? Um, so there's something more rhetorical than exegetical there, I think, and, and maybe I could say, in Paul's use of. So I like, I think one of the translations says, you know, I'm, I'm, here I'm speaking in figures of speech. Uh, yeah, that's what he's doing. His, his exegesis is, is contextual and based in the, based in the Old Testament text. I, I, I think we established that. Uh, the way he's referring back to those passages is, is using figures of speech. And it, of course, it's not wrong to use figures of speech, as long as those are communicating uh, to your audience and aren't going to, uh, to lead them to you know, make um, bad interpretive uh, choices themselves. Does that help? So if I'm getting your concept right, it's like when he's piling up all of 
this figurative language. These, anyway, these become just illustrations. The undergirding conclusion is based on something that would be closer to like what we would call um, normative exegesis, like exegesis that we could duplicate. Um, yes. It's not that he's necessarily from the stories pulling out his content. It's like the content or the conclusions are already there based on Isaiah 54 type of exegesis, stuff that I could duplicate. And then the Hagar stuff, Sinai stuff, Pilate of the Jerusalem stuff is just a way of illustrating it. Yeah, so if I, if I speak in terms of the fourfold, the, the medievals, they taught they had a fourfold um, approach to exegesis. So they had the literal sense, the allegorical sense, the anagogical sense, and uh, oh, what's their last sense? Anyway. Um, tropological. Tropological, yes, thank you. Um, now, literal for them wasn't as tightly defined as, as we have it. Um, and allegorical, they mixed together figures of speech and actually what we would call allegory. They didn't distinguish between those two. Uh, I would say that what Paul is doing here would fall under their literal sense. But because he's using figures of speech, they get confused because they're lumping figures of speech and what we call allegory together under that allegorical sense. And I think that's what, in terms of the history of interpretation and, and history of exegesis, how these things play out, I think that's how they got confused about this about this text and, and what it would justify. It's fascinating to read Augustine on this uh, because Augustine does not make distinction. When he's justifying allegorical interpretations of scripture, he'll, he'll list a bunch of figures of speech and he'll say, no, certainly you don't expect me to interpret these literally, do you? And, and we would say, oh no, part of literal interpretation is to recognize the figure of speech as a figure of speech. But for him, uh, the, the figure of speech itself is part of the allegory. And what we would call an allegory is, yeah, so we're drawing the different lines into different places there. <coughs> it's interesting. That's helpful. Well, let me jump into 1 Corinthians 10. For this is another really hard one, uh, and hopefully we'll have time. <laughs> In the remaining uh, 30 minutes to actually um, to actually uh, do all of this. Um, so uh, 1 Corinthians 10 4 is a passage that Origen appealed to as justifying uh, as, as an example of allegorical interpretation in, in the Bible. And modern interpreters, some modern interpreters have supported Origen in his claim, most notably uh, Peter Enns. Uh, this is before he apostatized, uh, but some of his articles in 1996, uh, Bulletin of Biblical Research, he's, he's making this argument. Modern interpreters who favor a non-literal approach proceed by connecting Paul's statement, for they drank from the spiritual rock. Let's actually get this, this text in mind. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink, where they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, nevertheless, most of them, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So uh, modern interpreters who favor a non-literal approach, they perceive by connecting Paul's statement, they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them with Jewish uh, traditions that speak about uh, a movable uh, well. However, later rabbinic sources aren't a sure guide uh, to Jewish thought at the time of the New Testament, because uh, late rabbinic sources actually post-date the New Testament, and so it's actually not clear in what form this legend about the movable well existed in Paul's day. And this is something that, like uh, Earl Ellis would note. He says it's very difficult to determine the price, precise character of the fable in the first century uh, because we just don't have any real evidence that takes it all the way back to the first century. There's only one source that may be from the first century that mentions a form of the legend, and it mentions actually a well that followed them, but it actually doesn't mention a rock that followed them. That would be uh, in pseudophilo. Um, so that, that's a complication. <clears throat> 
also the existence of such a tradition, the existence of a tradition of a moving well, doesn't actually mean that Paul drew on that uh, tradition. Both uh, Godet and Hodge, who are 19th century uh, interpreters of 1 Corinthians, they both reject the idea out of hand because they say Paul explicitly rejects Jewish, myth, Jewish myths in 1 Timothy uh, 1.4. And I, I think that's a, a compelling argument. Uh, Godet says, how can we imagine for a moment the most spiritual of the apostle holding and, in teaching, holding and teaching the church such pluralities? And Hodge says the view of the passage makes the apostle responsible for a Jewish fable and inconsistent with his uh, divine authority. Um, modern interpreters that also reject this view will be G.K. Beale in his book on inspiration and inerrancy. He deals with this passage. He has a very good treatment of this passage in his book, Inspiration and Inerrancy. Uh, I think it's more likely that Paul relied on Jewish scriptures rather than Jewish myths in writing 10.4. Because in the Pentateuch itself, God is addressed with the Appalachian rock. Deuteronomy 32.4, Deuteronomy 32.15, verse 18, verses 30-31. Um, he identifies God as the rock. So I think Paul may reasonably make a wordplay with the idea of a physical rock that supplied water to the people and rock as a title for the God who was present with his people and who provided the spiritual food and drink uh, for them. Um, I think this move on Paul's part was actually not entirely unprecedented. I don't think Paul himself is, is just alone making this connection. I think he sees an Old Testament warrant for it, or we could say scriptural warrant for making this connection. Psalm 78 brings together the title of this title for God, rock, the provision of water, and the presence of God in a context similar to that of 1 Corinthians 10. Um, the psalm recounts the blessings of God upon Israel and Israel's subsequent rebellion. Uh, verse 14 indicates the presence theme, the presence of God theme by reference to the pillar of cloud and fire. Uh, verses 15 and 16 speak of God as splitting rocks in the desert to provide water for the people. Uh, incidentally, I think the plural rocks undermines the theory that the rock in Exodus 17 and the rock in Numbers 20 were the same rock. That was, that's, you know, they talk about this following rock. It's the same rock, and it just kind of rolled along with them in the desert because it's, you know, this, the same, it was the same rock that provides water. But, but Psalm uh, 78 actually mentions rocks plural. So I think it undermines that theory. Um, and it, these verses also describe Israel's rebellion. Um, verses 17 through 31 describes is, Israel's rebellion. Verse 20 mentions the provision of water through the striking of a rock. And verse 32 notes that their sin was despite God's miraculous working on their behalf. Verse 35 reveals that the Israelites needed to remember that God was their rock. I know Dr. Arnold's put that up on the screen. Did, was that clear enough? Kind of step through the passage like that. Um, you know, you all may have that passage in front of you, but the point, the point is that Psalm 78 is already, already bringing together the idea of God, God's presence, God providing water for them from the rock in the wilderness. And so I would say to identify this rock as Christ doesn't provide anyone difficulty for anyone who believes Christ is God. So it's kind of a play in words here is what's going on. God already in Deuteronomy is called the rock. There is a rock that provides uh, water for them in the wilderness. Who ultimately is providing water for them in the wilderness? The rock is providing water for them in the wilderness, not just you know, these, these physical rocks. So I don't think Paul's allegorizing when he calls Christ the rock who provided water to the Israelites. He's, I think he's simply making a wordplay with an existing title to highlight the presence of Christ among the Israelites in the wilderness. Christ really was in the wilderness with Israel. He really did stand behind the provision of water from the physical rocks, and he was given the title rock by Moses. Uh, so I don't think Paul was adapting a Jewish fable of a rock that followed him around, uh, and I don't think, I think he was building off connections already made in the Old Testament and applying them to his present situation.
Any questions on, on this one? I also find that helpful. It's good. Uh, maybe since we have time, I'll, I'll maybe try to pick up a couple more. Just turn if you're in First Corinthians ten, turn back to First Corinthians nine. Um, this is a passage that was sometimes also appealed to <coughs> as being allegorical in nature. So this is First Corinthians nine uh, nine through ten. Uh, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not speak entirely for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher thresh in hope of the shearing of the crop. So in this passage, Paul cites Deuteronomy 25.4, uh, which dealt with the treatment of oxen and asked, is it for the oxen that God is concerned? And then he says, and the, here the translations uh, differ uh, a, a little bit. The, the ESV here says, if I get my eyes back on it, um, does he not speak entirely for our sake? Uh, the NIV actually says this, um, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? And I actually like that translation a bit better. The ESV makes it sound as though Paul's denying the original intent of the law. Does he not speak this entirely for our sake and not for the sake of the oxen at all? Um, but the NIV translates it, uh, surely he says this for us, uh, doesn't he? Now what that is, is that's a non-exclusive translation of the word pontos. Uh, so ES, the uh, ESV translates pontos exclusively. He, it translates pontos as meaning entirely for us. Uh, the, the NIV translates it non-exclusively. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? BDAG lists five senses with glosses for Pontos. First, pertaining to strong assumption by all means, certainly, probably, doubtless. Second, pertaining to thoroughness and extent, totally, altogether. Uh, third, the expression of an ine inevitable conclusion in view of the data provided, of course, be their gloss. Fourth, <coughs> expression of the lowest possible estimate on the scale of extent, at least five with a negating marker, not at all, by no means. And BDAG lists uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 9 under sense one. Uh, by all means, certainly, probably doubtless, uh, and this would cohere with the translation of the NIV. Um, so I like, I like that approach. Um, because this means that the, the first question need not be understood to absolutely exclude God's uh, concern for oxen. Um, yeah, God's concerned about oxen, but he's not just concerned about oxen in this passage. Um, so Paul, what Paul is saying here is that there is an extended application that applies to humans uh, as well. Uh, now, the Old Testament context, I think, points toward this extended application. In its context, the command regarding oxen stands alone among commands to provide for the needy. I, I wonder, Joel, if you, could, if you could actually drop us back into uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25. Put that up on the screen. So you can see there, it's uh, Deuteronomy 25, 4 is our verse. But you can see that standing alone in commands that are not about oxen, but are commands um, that are about providing for the needy, or um, I think the needy are back up in 24, and, and this immediate context is about uh, disputes and, and so forth. Um, so I think in context, even, it's possible that this command uh, was an illustration of the kind of care that people should have for one another. Uh, this shows up in Godet. Godet says, does not the whole context in Deuteronomy show clearly enough what the object of the prohibition quoted was here? Can you scroll back up into, verse, into chapter 24 and see if we capture some of that uh, context? Yeah, so here you have not perverting justice due to the sojourner and reaping the harvest field and forgetting the sheaf and so forth. So Godet says, it was not from solicitude for oxen that God made this prohibition. There were other ways of providing for the nourishment of these animals. 
By calling on the Israelites to exercise gentleness and gratitude, even toward a poor animal, it is clear that God desired to inculcate on them with stronger reason the same way of asking toward the human workmen whose help they engaged uh, their labor. So I, I think this means that Paul interpreted Deuteronomy 25, 4 with more care to its original context than to those who claim he succumbed uh, to allegory. Questions on, on that? Uh, let me uh, see if we have any things showing up in the chat. Or Joel, go ahead. In way, this, yeah, in a way, this text, um, a part of me has always felt like I don't get what all the fuss is, in a way, on this particular text. This, yeah, anyway, Paul's argument, I think, makes sense, kind of lesser to the greater sort of thing. It's like, okay, so you're supposed to have a fence around the top of your roof. Well, okay, this, God's not thinking about roofing people. He's thinking about someone falling off. Take care of your people. And it's sort of like that sort of structure of the argument. Um, in the sense where even some of the places, and I think there's this, I mean, rabbinic interpretation or his, uh, like Jewish historical interpretation was onto something where maybe it would give a command, if a man does this to a woman, and they're like, okay, obviously, if a woman does this to a man, or a woman does this to a woman, or a man does this to a man, come on, come on, guys. It's like you give the one example, but you don't go through all of the, you know, all of the possible configurations. Um, am I processing that right, or is there something more that I'm... No, 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 I think you're right. So, so, in other words, what you're saying is, even if this command is primarily about oxen, uh, even if Godet is wrong when he says, actually, in context, it's not, you know, the context is about other... See, Godet's argument would be stronger if Deuteronomy 25.4 showed up right after, De you know, right between chapters 24 and chapter 25. Uh, so maybe you say, okay, there's a, there's a point of weakness there in Godet's argument. So let's not say Godet is wrong. This is, this is a command about oxen, and it just got thrown in here. Even so, what Paul is doing is not really interpreting allegorically. He is, he's, he's drawing a principle out of a, out of a passage. Uh, and you're right, it's a lesser to greater principle. If you're not supposed to muzzle the ox, then of course, you know, you should pay your pastor uh, for his work. If even the ox gets to eat when he's turning out the grain, then yes, you should, you should pay uh, the men that, that... So you're right. Now, part of what's happening here is, is I've already dealt with the stronger passages uh, in Scripture that would argue for allegory. Um, an allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament, and so um, and so now we're getting into passages that are, I think, just just weaker in terms of the argument. But they were passages that people of origin appealed to uh, in making this case. Well, and I mean, it's not just then either. I I hear fuss about it now. It's just yeah, I hear fuss about it now. I think because somebody wants to make a point or whatever. To march through that bar door. How about we do Brian Tate's question here? If you want. Yeah, yeah, it's um, great. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that's a broader question. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. You, you go yeah, I, I want to make sure that fit with what we're doing. Um, I love what you're saying about, um, you know, this is, this is the uh, correct application, correct interpretation of the text. And we know that this would have been built in from a, a divine authorial perspective. Can you kind of address how? How much we should require, you know, the question would be, could the original readers of Deuteronomy have interpreted it in this way? Is that a legit requirement to put on the text? Can you kind of um, address that a little bit? Yeah, so in, in this case, yeah, I think the original readers probably would have made that kind of connection. Um, uh, be, because of what Dr. Arnold's saying, uh, in terms of, they customarily, when they interpret the law, they, they didn't just, they're, they're, the Jewish law code wasn't like our law code, where it's like, okay, this is what the law says, and if it doesn't like specify all the details, then you're, you're not covered. It was more of like, this is the, this is the general principle, that where I'm, I'm giving you a general example, and then you need to, the judges need to be wise to figure out how those examples apply to other situations. Uh, so in this particular case, yeah, I, I think the original audience could have picked it up. Are there, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make your question harder for me and say, are there passages where uh, somebody in the New Testament is, is, is 
is doing something with the text that somebody in the original context uh, would have said, oh, you know, I, I wouldn't have thought of that application. I wouldn't have thought of that interpretation. And because I believe in progressive revelation, yes. Uh, what I don't want to do is disconnect the authorial intent of the original writers from divine authorial intent, as if they're two separate things and they can operate in two separate tracks. Um, but uh, because I do believe in progressive revelation, I do think that later writers can, under, can understand and interpret text with greater understanding than even the original author. And because you came here to learn to have me talk about land, I'll, I'll maybe give land promise as, as an example of that. Um, land promise, when it was given to Abraham, uh, was given to him and his physical seed. Uh, I don't want to do kind of a, a reality transfer, you know, where, you know, what God promised to uh, the physical descendants of Abraham uh, now are pro promised to his spiritual descendants, uh, the church. And so there's been a reality transfer in this. Oh, and land, some people don't do this, but some people, land is now fulfilled in Christ himself as a person. And there is no physical aspect to that land. That's been transcended. The physicality has been transcended. I don't want to do that. But uh, I do see the expansion of these promises uh, to uh, Israel. Um, so I would, what, the way I would interpret that is the Old Testament promise uh, to Israel of a land will be fulfilled for the people of Israel in the future on, in the new creation. And that land promise will be expanded to encompass all of the people of God as well. So they get the land that was promised to them in their borders, but that but that land actually gets expanded out. And there's now what what there are some hints of this, and actually I think in Genesis. Uh, but would would the original readers of Genesis have picked up on those hints? I don't know that they that they necessarily would have. But by the time we get into the New Testament and we get promises, I do think promises uh, like. Um, in Romans four, or even in Matthew five five, the you know the the meek shall inherit the the earth, uh, do start to get expanded out to include all of God's people. But I want to do such that in such a way that I'm not doing violence to the original human authorial intent um, of those passages. Does that make sense? Okay, can I face a, a passing comment you made in there about not disconnecting? divine and human authorial intent, um, just because I, I did argue previously, not broadly, but in some cases, the concept of the human author speaking better than he knows. So, sure. um, but, but what would be your concerns about, yeah, kind of disconnecting? So in other words, the divine author is, is directing this, and so we, we root meaning in divine authorial intent, and yet Daniel doesn't actually get what he wrote. <laughs> And it's only going to be way down the road that people are going to be able to understand it. Not even Daniel gets everything or the significance of what he said. Yeah. Um, like, I don't think, like, even in Daniel, I mean, there's certain things that Daniel himself says he doesn't understand. And he's just conveying to us things that he, that he saw and he doesn't fully understand. Um, but even in those chapters, I would be hesitant if someone said, now Daniel interpreted the text this way, or Daniel, people interpreted Daniel this way. But now we know that there's this completely different interpretation that doesn't really have an, a connection to what Daniel is saying, and, and that's the divine intents. The divine intents over here, and Daniel's intents over here, and they aren't linked. Uh, I just, I don't, I don't see that. Um, I see God inspired these men to, to give us scripture, and and that that scripture has uh, has meaning. In that meaning, we can develop a, a broader understanding of what that what that text means because we've received more revelation that uh, that expands on on our understanding. So we understand things better than than Daniel does. I mean, Jesus. We talk about. I'll give a preview of the discourse. Uh, Jesus interprets some of the things in Daniel so that we now understand things that Daniel talked about better than Daniel did. Uh, 
But that doesn't mean that Daniel understood this in one way and Jesus understands it in a different way. That's very helpful. So if I'm getting the concept, it's like, we, we want to be very guarded about uh, the actual meaning ran against what Daniel thought. Um, it's still going to run in line. It's just Daniel's not even going to re- understand all the fullness of what he put down. Yeah. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. So Brother Kenneth raised a question. Uh, he says, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples in John 13 is interpreting literally by the Roman Catholic Church, but I don't believe Jesus had any literal interpretation intended. I, I, I think I think we're getting caught up here on what is meant by literal. And I do confess that I do try to avoid the word literal when I'm in hermeneutical discussions unless it's unavoidable. Because people have all kinds of different meaning. So what what the medievals and the patristics meant by literal in their fourfold hermeneutic uh, is different from what the reformers meant by literal, which is different from what modern people often mean by literal. Um, and there's also the difference of, <laughs> it is literally difficult not to say literal, I, I know. Uh, that is good, Duncan. Um, <clears throat> it, yes, it, so sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to avoid. People, the, even in the dictionary, there's two different senses of literal. Uh, literal can mean just normal interpretation, or literal can mean like that, that would include a figures of speech, or literal could mean interpreting like a figure of speech, literally. So I'm not going to inter- interpret it according to its figure. Uh, and so that the word ends up being really slippery in the way that, that people use it. And the, now, I think what you're saying here is that the, the Roman Catholic Church, they look at, I, I, and correct me if I'm understanding this wrong, what you're saying. I think what you're saying is that in John 13, they say that Jesus is doing this, and we're supposed to actually carry this practice out as well. But Jesus was doing this not for us to carry the passage out ourselves. Um, now, I would say that I interpret John 13 literally. In other words, uh, I think that Jesus actually washed the disciples' feet. Um, now, I also think that my literal interpretation of that passage means that there was some, actually, a, that was a symbolic action on the part of Jesus. Uh, He was actually intending to communicate something uh, by doing that action. It just wasn't like, oh, he just was washing the feet. Uh, Just like everybody always washed feet as people came in. It's not just an incidental detail in the narrative. Jesus is actually intending to communicate something symbolically with that. I think that's part of a literal interpretation of that passage in the sense of a normal interpretation of the passage. I don't think that Jesus is is setting up an ordinance here that we ought, uh, ought to follow. Um, oh, so I get what you're saying. This is the actual statement. Uh, it's the actual statement that he says, um, do likewise, right? That's what they interpret. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm more on your wavelength now. That's what they're interpreting literally. I, so, so I think what Jesus is saying in that statement is not go around washing people's feet. But he's telling them to pick up on the symbolism of what he's doing in that action and to live out what that action symbolizes. That's what they're supposed to do likewise. They're supposed to do likewise what that action symbolized, not just repeat that action all the time. So that that is how I would interpret that passage. And I would argue that my interpretation is a literal (laughs) interpretation of the passage. That's a, that's a, uh, um, you know, I, because I'm arguing that's exactly what Jesus intended. Uh, oh, yeah. So the NIV. Um, but even there, someone could argue the example, you know, what is the example? The example is, uh, is the example to actually literally wash people's feet? There, I use that word again. Or is it to pick up on the symbol of uh, of what? Uh, Jesus is, is is communicating there. Another comment here. Yes, interpreting the Bible in terms of its entire storyline is very helpful. Uh, that that helps us um, know whether our interpretations are are um, 
you know, if you have an interpretation of a certain passage that is completely out of the, the narrative flow of the passage, that would be, that would indicate there's, there's a problem there. There's a question I'll just toss it in, then I think we'll wrap up here. Um, so as you've used the Beale and Carson edited uh, New Testament commentary in the Old Testament, that's our textbook support, and I've been it a lot from it. But um, any, any uh, like, your overall impressions with it, any things you've noticed as far as the quality of different contributors, where maybe a section, one section might be stronger or weaker, or how much you've used it, or any kind of summary you want to give us, uh, cautions, concerns, or otherwise about the book, any, anything to come to your mind there? Yeah, let me, uh, does the table of contents tell me who wrote? It does. It breaks it down, break down by section. Yeah, um, yeah. In general, these comp these contributors are good. Uh, the one that I would have probably the most questions about would be maybe Rick Watts. Um, his big thing is a new Exodus and Mark. I'm not sure that all of his connections are are, are good. I spent a lot of time with Beal, G.K. Beal, and Revelation. Beal is very helpful um, in, in giving us where there are Old Testament allusions and echoes and so forth in Revelation. When I actually look at how he interprets those, I, I'm not always impressed that he's paying close enough attention to the details. So I've, I've, I, what, what strikes me is I really like Beal's stated methodology. Um, he, he is also very concerned that we, we understand that the Old Testament texts are being rightly interpreted by the New Testament writers. And that actually when you go into the Old Testament texts and you want to look at those texts in their context, and when you do that, you see that the, the, the New Testament writers are interpreting them rightly. But I'm not always convinced by his exegesis, if that makes, if that makes sense. I mentioned that one because uh, Revelation is where I've, I've been uh, studying recently. And so I have more experience with that than maybe some of the other parts of the parts of the book. That's helpful. Okay. Um, well, thank you. This is great. And just, I, it gives us also a, kind of another pass through a more general philosophy about how to think through some of these questions. So anyway, very helpful. Thank you very much for your time with this. Um, I'm oh, dropping you. in here. Yes. Uh, dropping in here for the chat for everyone, uh, our next lecture on Monday with Dr. Casillas. The homework there is just to read through the blog post that will come up when you do your search. So if you just take, it shouldn't take that long, but read through the couple of articles he's, uh, he has given us there. And then we will see Dr. Collins again one week from today. So uh, if you have particular questions related to the stuff that we talked about today or you'd like some further feedback on something, just store that up, send it over to me or something like that. You can send it directly to Dr. Collins if, you, if you're already in contact, but um, then we will come back to this next week. So Dr. Collins, until next week, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in, uh, in a week. Oh, it was great. It was great to see old friends from seminary. It was great to see newer friends from the Philippines and Singapore and uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed this. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, good night. Thank you to all. Good night, all.